Um, and so our next talk is, and I'm, I'm sorry if I get your name wrong, Suvik Bhattacharjee from the University of Alabama. And they will be talking about controls on large scale architecture and facies distribution of a carbonate shelf margin um, in the Nanpenjing Basin of China with implications for exploration of the Jurassic Smackover Formation. So with that being said, I will switch over sharing and we can get started. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Shovik Bhattacharji. I'm a PhD student at the University of Alabama. And today I will be presenting on a uh, part of my PhD research. As the title suggests, my field area is in South China. The red box marks the location in Zhongfeng, Guizhou. The early Triassic carbonates between the Nanpanjian Basin in red and the surrounding Yangtze platform in blue forms low angle ramp or shelf style margin following a late Permian regional transgression. This mixed carbonate shelf not only displays variations in carbonate factory types, for example, microbialites, oolites, lime mudstones, backstones, but also displays variations in architecture. <laughs> We can see aggradational to progradational patterns. In the field, a complete platform to basin transect is exposed and preserved, and thus it serves as a natural lab to study shelf carbonates. These triassic carbonates also serve as an excellent analog to the smackover formation, having similar carbonate factories, environment of deposition, and overall architecture. The two conceptual depositional models over here shown are from the Triassic Carbonates of South China and the Kaneka embayment from the Gulf of Mexico. What I want to highlight over here is the similarity in terms of the overall architecture where we see uh, the program clinoforms and the carbonate factories as well. So over here or uh, in the dark, we have the microbialites and in light blue, we have the shallow water oolites, which is also observed in the smackover formation. Now, the purpose of this research is to understand what controls the overall architecture and distribution of these carbonate factories, and also to quantify the impact of these controls or these parameters. In order to do so, I've used stratigraphic forward modeling uh, with the help of uh, the software Dionysos Flow by BC Fran Lab. Now, this uh, involves building a conceptual model at the beginning, uh, then gathering input parameters for accommodation, sediment generation, and sediment transport, and then building the 3D numeric model based on these acquired data, and finally comparing the numeric model with the conceptual model. And this process is uh, carried out in cycles still. There is a reasonable match between the conceptual model and the final numeric model. The data that I'm using to generate these models are a combination of information collected from the field uh, and literature study. Now, once again, uh, what I'm trying to do here is not just replicate what I see in the field, but also to uh, understand and quantify like which parameters exert the greatest control on the geometry and the architecture of these carbonates. In order to do so, I've modeled these five facies, as you can see over here, all of which are also present in this map over. And I've done sensitivity analysis on all the parameters that I'll be discussing in the following slides. So uh, the first parameter is bathymetry which has been mapped in the field uh, it's, it's this surface in the dashed red line now uncertainty can be reduced with additional field work which would help us model the bathymetry better uh, but we also know that there is huge uncertainty when modeling surfaces from seismic data so there is a lot of value in assessing the impact of value bathymetry on the overall architecture uh, the graph 
here uh, shows the result of the sensitivity analysis for the end one, which is the lower lower Triassic. On the X axis, I have the range of the parameters tested. In this case, the different bathymetries. On the Y axis, I have the geometry. Over here, I have the thickness on top of the platform, the width of the shelf, and the width of the slope. In all the future graphs that I'll be showing, the X axis will always have the range of the parameters, while the Y axis will have the geometry. Now, what we observe over here is that the initial bathymetry does influence the thickness on top of the platform, and it also does influence uh, the width, but to not as much extent as it influences the thickness on top of the platform. We know that at the end of the Permian, there was a regional transgression and drowning of the platform, but we cannot pinpoint the exact depth of the basement with respect to the mean sea level. And hence, uh, the uncertainty with respect to the initial position of the mean sea level is uh, also equally important. So, once again, on the x-axis, I have the different range of the initial mean sea levels that I've tested, and on the y-axis, uh, at the geometry. Uh, the results indicate that the change, um, with the change in initial mean sea level, uh, there is a substantial change in the width of the shelf and the slope, but not so much uh, as to the thickness on top of the platform. Subsidence has been modeled in two ways. Firstly, as single values for age, either measured from the field or taken from the literature studies, and I've tested a wide range of values for that. And secondly, as uh, subsidence curves built from relative sea level curves. Uh, the general observation from these models is that uh, the models built using the subsidence curve uh, are a lot more realistic than the ones that are built using single values for age. And what we observe here is uh, the subsidence impacts the thickness on the uh, the thickness of the formation on top of the platform and the width of the shelf as well, but uh, not so much on the slope. I've built four different relative sea level models based on the observations in the field, as it is important to capture the uncertainty with respect to the relative sea level or the accommodation. And four subsidence curves have been generated from these different four relative sea level uh, curves. On, on the x-axis, I have uh, the different sea level curves, and on the y axis, I have the geometry. Now, the models show that one of these curves uh, generates significantly lesser thickness on top of the platform than the others, while they don't really have an impact on the shelf or uh, the slope as such. This is one of the most important parts. So uncertainty in carbonate production uh, is, is measured in two types. One is production versus depth on the left, and the other one is carbonate production versus time or carbonate production rate. For example, what we see in here is that uh, by changing the maximum depth of the microbial production, it results in changing the amount of progradation of the margin and the shelf. Now, these graphs are uh, the results for production versus change in depth of microbial lights only. And what we see in here that uh, there is a slight change in thickness of the platform, but there is a significant change in the width of the shelf and the slope uh, when we change uh, the maximum production depth of the microbial lights. And sensitivity of architecture to the transport and uh, redeposition of carbonate sediments, it has been measured through varying the transport coefficient of each carbonate sediments. 
what the transport coefficient essentially controls is uh, the capacity of each sediment type to be transported for a given slope angle. A wide range of uh, transport coefficients were tested to assess the impact of the sediment transport on the geometry of the shelf margin. Our analysis suggests that the platform or shelf geometry is most sensitive to the transport coefficient of the microbialites, as we see in here, than the other sediments. And the transport coefficient, I mean, changing the transport coefficient doesn't really uh, do much to the thickness on top of the platform. So to summarize, uh, uncertainty analysis of all of these parameters have been done to quantify their impact on the geometry. And like I said in the beginning, the idea is not just to model and replicate what we see in the field, but to assess which parameter exerts uh, the maximum impact on the geometry and platform architecture. In all of these graphs on the x-axis, I have uh, on the x-axis I have the different parameters and the tested ranges clubbed together. On the y-axis, I have the geometry that I'm measuring. Uh, so in the first graph, the thickness on top of the platform is uh, most sensitive to bathymetry and the single value subsidence ranges. The width of the shelf is uh, most sensitive to the microbial production depth, the transport coefficient, and the initial mean sea level. And the width of the slope uh, includes uh, both the inner slope and the outer slope. Uh, it's most sensitive to the microbial production depth in here and in here. Uh, the initial mean sea level, the, the line margin production rate, and the bathymetry. So different parameters exert different levels of control on the overall geometry, uh, some more than the others, with the shelf and the slope being most sensitive to the maximum production depth of the microbialites. And that is all for this part of the project. I'm currently working on the stratigraphic forward modeling for the smackover formation in the Gulf of Mexico. And I'll then work on generating synthetic seismic from these stratigraphic forward models for both uh, South China and the smackover formation. And I'll eventually compare the synthetic seismic with the real seismic from the smackover. This will help in testing and identifying what different carbonate factories look like in the seismic, sort of a uh, facies atlas. And to an extent, uh, it'll help in predicting where specific carbonate factories can be expected when uh, looking at seismic data from similar environment of deposition. And that is the end of my presentation. Um, I'd like to thank my advisor, uh, my committee, my lab mates, and all my funding sources. And yeah, I'm, that's all. So if you have any questions, 